Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Karen Wilkowski. I am the Director of Education here at FAIR, and I am so delighted to be your moderator for today's discussion around navigating early childhood with food allergies. Um, before we get started, I just want to go over a quick few things. Um, just take a note that for maintaining a quality recording, all attendees are going to be muted throughout this presentation. However, that's definitely not going to stop you from joining in on the discussion today. Everyone should see on Zoom um, a toolbar. It's black and it should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, specifically in this toolbar, you'll see like a little Q&A button. You can use this to communicate um, directly with me. Let me know if you're having any technical difficulties and I will do my best to help you out. Um, but most importantly, you can use this feature to ask questions. Um, we've definitely built in a couple minutes at the end of the presentation for a few moderated questions. So please feel free you know, to send them my way at any time throughout the presentation. Um, and we'll, we'll make sure that our presenters can address them at the end. Um, just a quick FYI that in today's presentation, we're going to be sharing some videos. I don't even want to put this out there, but if something happens and the video is free, do not worry. We will be able to send you a link to where you can access those videos. And then as a side note, we are recording today's presentation. So we'll follow up with all of you with a link to the presentation, any resources that are mentioned, including those videos. Um, so without further ado, um, and all that out of the way, it is my pleasure to introduce today's lovely presenters. Um, first, we have Sarah Valeka. Sarah is an early childhood educator who currently serves as the project coordinator of an early childhood food allergy education initiative with our next presenter, Dr. Ruchi Gupta, as a member of the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research team. She has over 25 years of experience working with young children, their families, and providers in early childhood programming, as well as teaching in higher education and professional development settings. Sarah earned an MS in child development from the Erickson Institute in Chicago and has over a decade of experience preventing and managing life-threatening food allergies for one of her four children. Joining Sarah today, we have Dr. Ruchi Gupta. Dr. Gupta is a professor of pediatrics and medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and a clinical attending at Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. She has more than 16 years of experience as a board certified pediatrician and health researcher with more than 100 publications. As director of the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research at Northwestern, she is actively involved in clinical, epidemiological, and community based research. Dr. Gupta completed her undergraduate and medical education at the University of Louisville and her medical residency at Children's Hospital and Regional Medical Center, University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. She completed her Pediatric Health Service Research Fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School and her Master's of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. So we are so thrilled to have these two expert presenters here with us today and just share with you a little bit of their expertise. So we would love to know who else is joining us. So now that you've heard from us, who is here in the audience with us? So I'm going to launch this little poll and we wanna know kind of what is your role as it relates to um, food allergies in this topic today. So I'm just gonna pause for 30 seconds so we can kind of get an idea of who's with us today and then I will Kind of go behind the scenes and pass it off to Dr. Gupta to get us started. Wow, looks like we have a lot of people that work with children under six here with us today. That's great. Okay, I'll add a few more seconds and then I'll go ahead and end the poll and share the results just because it's always fun to know who's, um, who's in the room with us. All right, so we have over half the people who are working with children under six. About 30% of us here today have a parent of a child under six, and then 15% of us are just curious advocates for early childhood. So just thank you again to our presenters and so happy to have all of these attendees with us today. So I will pass on the presentation. 
Thanks so much. Um, we are so delighted to be here with all of you today. And thanks for tuning in uh, on your busy day. I am so excited. Sarah and I have been working on this project for a couple of years now, and we finally have something to share with you that I hope uh, will be very useful. And a little bit more about myself. You know, I am the mother also of a child with food allergies, uh, and she is now 14, but uh, we had to navigate all the early uh, childhood times, and it was quite challenging. So we, we, Sarah and I both learned from our own experience and then from our professional career. So um, we're excited to, uh, to share that with you. And so our agenda today, we're going to talk a little bit about what's a food allergy, then what's unique about early childhood, food allergy in parents, uh, food allergy in early childhood professionals, and then what matters and why. And then we're going to open it up for all your questions and try to answer them. So what is a food allergy? So uh, the definition is an immune system allergic reaction, IgE mediated, it's often called, that occurs soon after eating a certain food. Now, these reactions can range from mild to severe, and they can be potentially life-threatening. Anaphylaxis uh, is also commonly used, and this refers to a severe, potentially life-threatening allergic reaction that typically occurs quickly, so within seconds or minutes of exposure to the allergen. Uh, often, you'll hear symptoms of trouble breathing or uh, drop in blood pressure. Um, it's also can uh, have two system issues. And we'll go through this more a little bit later. And so what do we have right now to prevent? We just have to stay away from that allergic food. So this is uh, some of our research. So when Sarah, I'll tell you our story. Sarah came to me a couple years ago. She said, it's great, you're working in this area and you've developed videos for uh, schools, but you know, we really need something in early childhood. And so the first thing as researchers we do is try to understand you know, what it, are the needs uh, more than just what we think. So uh, we published a study uh, it's called Understanding Food Allergy Education Needs in Early Childhood. We did this in 2018 where we surveyed parents of young children and early childhood providers across the state of Illinois to understand what their food allergy education needs were. Now, what we found was that the majority of providers work with children with food allergies, but there is a strong need for more education on management, and they all uh, reported this. So what we did, so what our work was after this is to create an intervention to support their needs. And that, this is the creation of three videos, which we're gonna show you that were created to address the food allergy education needs. Hi, everyone. Um, when living and working with young children, whether you're at home or at school, it's best practice to take a little time to pause and reflect. So we're gonna try something a little bit different right now. We'd like you to use the question and answer box and type in a word, the first word that comes to mind when I read you this question. What is it like to be a child under six years old with a food allergy? First word that comes to mind, and Carrie's gonna help us and tell us some of the things she's seeing in the question and answers. Oh my goodness, we just got about the first five people say the word scary. A lot of scary coming in, scared, unaware left out, frightening, frustrating, confusing, different, unfair, restrictive, painful, con isolating, okay. nervous, fear, yeah, seems to be a common theme. Okay, so I have a little story for you. Um, my son was diagnosed with food allergies at six months and he has multiple food allergies. And at about, he was about nine months old at, at the time. And someone came up to, I was holding him, and someone came up to me and said, oh, can, I, can he have this cookie? And I said, oh, no, thank you. He has food allergies. And with that, the person who offered the cookie took a deep sigh and said, I am so, so sorry. Later that day, my then seven-year-old said to me, mom, 
why does everyone feel sorry for him? He's just a baby. And that question, um, along with a few others that were asked, really propelled me into this work, and that's why I'm here today. Um, so I would like to share with you that children absorb what they see and hear in their environments. And I'd like you to, uh, you don't have to put this answer in the question and answer, but here is your reflection question to think about. Is the word, excuse me, is, there, is the word that you entered, what you think it's like as an adult, looking, thinking about the child, or is it really, truly how the child feels? Okay, so what's unique about early childhood is uh, the ages we're dealing with. We're talking about infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Uh, One-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, little, little people. And I think when you see these goals of preschool, it gives you a sense of what it, all the work that goes on. These don't magically happen. Um, they emerge and development is, it comes in waves. So you'll see a little bit of a hint of it and then it goes away and that comes back. But this is what they're working on. And we're gonna revisit this later in the webinar. Okay, so we're gonna have a poll right now. And yeah. Hi, I'm gonna yes. launch the poll again. Okay. We surveyed yes. parents, yeah, we surveyed parents of children um, with and without food allergies. So we wanna know what you think. Who do you think we received more responses from? So we've got the poll going right now and it, it looks neck and neck from the beginning, but it looks like our attendees are thinking that um, you receive more responses from parents of children with food allergies. So we'll give just a, a couple more seconds and, um, and wrap it up. Okay, I'll go ahead and share those results. Looks like 70% of you joining us um, today thought that parents of children with food allergies um, responded more than parents of children without food allergies. Okay, so what did we learn from the survey of food allergy and parents? 75% of those, so almost opposite what everyone thought, who completed the survey were parents of children without food allergies. Now, this was really surprising for us too, because I think going into it, we thought we would find what all of you thought. Um, now, they, did, they know that food allergies are real and serious. 75% said their child has a friend with a food allergy. And we all know that this is true because our prevalence data shows that about one in 13 kids have a food allergy. So that would be about two in any normal size classroom. So 75% of these children of parents um, who, with these kids who don't have a food allergy did have a friend with a food allergy. So they are very interested and very curious. Uh, parents of children without food allergies wanted food allergy knowledge. They are willing to watch videos and they were willing to learn. So again, very encouraging that there is an awareness and a desire out there. So for parents, now this part is parents to parents. I'll launch the video now. Okay, perfect. All right, yes, this is our parent to parent video. So the three videos we made, one was parents talking to parents, and the other was for the um, child care providers, and then the third one was for the kids themselves. So this is parent to parent.
couldn't help but over here, but you, you work in food allergies? Yeah. Like, I, I've heard a lot about, you know, how they're on the rise and stuff, but well, how common are they really? Yeah, they are actually becoming more common. About 8% of kids have food allergy now. That is a lot of kids, actually. Yeah. Um, so what are the most common food allergies? So the most common food allergies in young children under six are, are milk, peanut, tree nuts, soy, wheat, shellfish, finfish, eggs, and sesame. Now these are the most common, but kids can be allergic to other foods. What can I do to, to find out if any of these allergens are, are in the food I'm buying? The only way you know is by reading the ingredients on the food label. We can't assume. And when cooking, you always have to make sure that there's no cross-contact. Got it. Um, but what, what's cross-contact? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It's when an allergic food accidentally gets mixed up with another food. For example, you're making a salad, you have one cutting board, you chop nuts, you slice eggs, you cube your cheese, chop up your lettuce, your veggies. But anything that touched that cutting board has had cross contact with allergen. Even if you don't put the nuts in the salad, the smallest trace of an allergen can cause an allergic reaction for a child who has that allergy. And so let's say an allergic child encounters their allergen. How would I know if they're having an allergic reaction? That is a great question. It can be very confusing because food allergies can impact any organ system. So some common reactions, especially in young children, involve the skin. So you can get hives, swelling, redness, itching, the GI system. So you can get vomiting, stomach aches and pains, diarrhea. It can impact the respiratory system. So you can get tightness of the throat, trouble breathing, tightness of the chest, wheezing. And it can even impact the cardiovascular system. So you can have a drop in blood pressure and fainting. Now what's really important is to recognize it's happening and if multiple systems are affected or it's a severe reaction, you need to know when and how to use epinephrine. And also know if you're ever in doubt, it's okay to give epinephrine. What can parents do to help? Stop and ask other parents and staff at the child care centers if there are children with any food allergies in your child's classroom. Look at food labels, never assume. Ask if a child has a food allergy before offering food. Go and keep learning about food allergies in young children. So we learned that parents help parents and we want parents to help parents. How in some of the other ways in addition to what was said in the video are you can share your child's emergency action plan and medications with any adult caring for the child. And if you're on the receiving end of that child coming to your house or to your center, you can ask for that and ask about what, what you should know about their allergies. Talk to parents before a play date, a party, an event. On the day of an event, I found from my experience, people are thinking about the event and it's just, uh, it's a way of preparation to actually do this in advance. So try to talk to them, let them know what food you're bringing or that you are bringing food or how this is gonna work. But on either end, um, even if you're the host and you know someone's coming with a food allergy, it always helps when you reach out before the actual moment of the get together. Uh, food allergy policies impact all children, all parents. So reassure all children, it goes um, very far. They, they need positive role models and using really simple, concrete, honest language works. And we try to make it easy for everyone. Um, you know, offer to bring a snack, offer to leave a snack at the center in case you forget some time to bring a snack. Um, offer to read food labels. FAIR has excellent resources. Find some, share them. That's, that's how you help other parents, how parents can help parents. So, we have another poll for you right now. We surveyed early childhood professionals. How many do you believe, how, how many early childhood providers believe they are unprepared to administer epinephrine? Okay, <clears throat> we've got some early answers coming in. It looks like right now, C, 38% is a little in the lead, um, ahead of B, 
And then just a small percentage of attendees are thinking either A or D, or 23% or 10%. So we'll just give a, a couple seconds more to see if uh, the answer C still, still stays as the top pick. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share those results and we can see what everyone thought. Looks like most most attendees chose C. So curious to see what the what the answer is. Okay. All right. Well, this time everybody was right. Um, so when we uh, looked at seed allergy in early childhood professionals, this is what we learned. We learned that 69% were actually formally trained in seed allergy. However, 38% believed they were unprepared to administer epinephrine, even though they were trained. 52% were unfamiliar with the emergency action plan related terms. So uh, some of you are parents or um, child care professionals and care for kids with food allergies. We know that that emergency action plan can be complex. So ask the questions or, or please, you know, go over it because they do refer to things like body system and, you know, body system is, is not a common term. And for mild symptoms from more than one system area or for mild systems from a single system area. So honestly, you know, how to determine anaphylaxis is complicated even for physicians. Um, so really thinking through this, going through it with your doctor first to really understand uh, what it's saying and then making sure uh, your child care uh, providers actually do understand because in the, in the moment, it, is, it could be very challenging to look over that. So that's, that's definitely very critical. All right, so providers also said one in four of them had witnessed an allergic reaction at the early childhood center. Now that was also very surprising to us. So 25% had seen an allergic reaction happen in their child care center. And then again, more than 25%, however, were unfamiliar with the emergency action plan. So the same amount, about 25%, did not know what an emergency action plan was. Less than half were comfortable identifying allergy-friendly food labels. And almost half wanted to know how to talk with children about food allergies. So here we go. Here's the video now we will play for you for early childhood professionals. And this is one, you know, we hope to share with uh, child care centers, but please share it with your own and spread the word on it. Um, this, is, this is hopefully going to be our training video for early childhood professionals soon. And sorry about the quality of, you know, the videos are slow. They actually, you know, move faster when you will share it and watch it on your own. Food allergies are common in child care centers. We surveyed early childhood professionals and learned that 77% work with one or more children with a food allergy. Food allergy is a medical condition impacting 1 in 13 children, and it can be life-threatening. The goal is to prevent an allergic reaction, and the only way to do this is by staying away from the allergen. So, let's see if you're ready. Start with children and adults getting in the habit of washing hands, as well as staff wiping down tables, chairs, and playground equipment. Prepare the environment by removing allergens. On food labels, the allergens can be listed in the ingredients section or it may be clearly listed in bold under the word contains. It is possible that even if the item doesn't contain the allergen, it could be processed in a facility that contains the allergen. Only the top eight major food allergens are required by law to be clearly listed on labels. These include peanut, tree nuts, milk, egg, wheat, soy, shellfish, and finfish. Sesame may be added to that list. Other allergens must be carefully looked for in the label. Children with diagnosed allergies should have an emergency action plan from their doctor. It is specific to each child, telling you what the child is allergic to, and explains how you should manage the reaction if it should occur. Administrators and directors should request the emergency action plan 
from the parents and share it with all staff that interact with children throughout the day. Also, discuss precautions needed with parents and understand any previous reactions. Know where medicine is kept. Take it with you when you go outside and on field trips. You're not feeling very good, are you? If the child feels faint, passes out, has a racing pulse or weak pulse, that's the cardiovascular body system reacting. Does their voice sound hoarse or different somehow? An answer is not necessary, but if the child is verbal, listen to the words they say. If the child is holding their throat, feeling tightness in the throat, expresses difficulty swallowing, feels tightness in their chest or wheezing, or if it's hard for the child to breathe, that's the respiratory system reacting. Do you see hives or are they scratching? If the child develops hives, redness, swelling, or itching, the integumentary system, which includes the skin, is reacting. If the child vomits or feels stomach pain, that's the gastric system reacting. If two systems are reacting, or if the child is having trouble breathing or fainting, this is a severe reaction known as anaphylaxis. The severity and progression of an allergic reaction is unpredictable. In that moment, we don't know if it will be mild or severe. We must compare the symptoms we observe with the child's emergency action plan to decide if epinephrine should be administered. Anytime the child has multiple symptoms or severe symptoms, administer epinephrine and call 911. Be prepared to give a second dose of epinephrine if symptoms do not get better. If you have any doubt, it is okay to use epinephrine. Here's what we're gonna do, okay? You're gonna be okay, but your body is getting very sick from something that you ate. And we need to give you medicine to make your body feel better, okay? Then we'll go to the hospital and the doctors will make sure you're better and your parents will meet us there, okay? Remove the epinephrine auto-injector from the case, then remove the safety cap. Secure the child. Press into the lateral thigh and count for three seconds before removing the auto-injector. After removing, gently massage the child's leg for about 10 seconds and comfort the child until the ambulance arrives. Food allergies are on the rise, and it's a medical condition that can cause a severe, life-threatening reaction. Prepare the environment. Number one, look at food labels. Never assume. Two, look at the child's emergency action plan. Each child has their own. And three, look at the child. The body will send signs and symptoms. Ask yourself, am I ready? Children under six depend on you to be ready. If you stop, look, and ask, and it's okay, go and eat the food. If you stop, look, and ask, and it's not okay, go find an alternative food. If there was an accidental ingestion, go. Decide whether to administer epinephrine and go call 911. You can be a positive food allergy role model for all the children by singing a song at the table when food is on their mind. We want them to stop before they eat, look at the food, Ask an adult if it's okay, and go if the adult says so. Adding a hand sign with each word allows the child to hear and see the message. Prepare the environment, remove allergens. Look at the food labels, never assume. Look at the child's emergency action plan. Look at the child, the body will send signs and symptoms. If there was an accidental ingestion, compare the symptoms you observe with the child's emergency action plan 
to decide if epinephrine should be administered and call 911. Food allergies are great. Thank you. So again, it's slow, but it will uh, it will be normal when you view it on your own or, or share it. Um, so parents help providers be proactive. Request a meeting with your provider before your child's first day to discuss the child's emergency action plan. And this is what we were talking about before. It's very important to sit down with them and make sure they understand uh, your emergency action plan and exactly what to do uh, if something were to happen. Be organized, have medication with you at all times and keep track of epinephrine expiration dates. So uh, many schools now have stock epinephrine, but many child care centers are starting to do that as well. You need to find out if yours does and give them your child's epinephrine as well and make sure you know, they know how to use your specific one. Because now that we have multiple choices in epinephrine auto injectors, it's important to know how to use them because they are slightly different. Be helpful read food labels and bring special snacks if needed. You can also help your provider uh, understand how to read those food labels for your child. Be careful. Hand sanitizers are not soap. Soap removes allergens. And as we know, in, in our, our current situation, hand sanitizers are very important and very popular. Uh, but again, they do not replace soap and especially for food allergies. Be an advocate. Share your food allergy knowledge with your provider. So all of this, you know, really recommend sitting down and discussing all of these areas with your provider in great detail. And if you need, then do this first with your uh, allergist or your pediatrician to make sure you understand it um, very well as well. And then reassure the child. Again, and we'll go through this um, Sarah well with you, but use simple, concrete language. Okay, so uh, we're back to the preschool goals and we're gonna kind of use them of what matters and why. So to be a positive food allergy role model, we, it helps to think about what young children at that age, and those ages are working on, self-esteem and competence. So what matters? Healthy attachments, competence, and feeling capable, and just the confidence to take an initiative. That's the work of, your, of early childhood. Why does it matter for food allergies? because it sets the stage for lifelong feelings, emotions, behaviors, and dealing with food allergies. And adults need to, can do this by preparing the environment so that there are safe places to explore and support their quest for independence. So an example of how that can sound when you're talking to kids is, look what I see, let me see your hands. Look, I see your hands are clean. Our tables are, are wiped down. We're ready to play. This room's ready. It's just kind of modeling and pointing out these of how you've prepared. Um, again, relationships are at the heart of early childhood. And it's important to think about what matters, that children need to feel safe and trust. They need to have respectful relationships and be trusting relationships. And now realize that this is a big leap. Children are leaving their home to go with new adults. So they need to form that same trust with the new people in their lives. So um, why it matters in food allergies is because children depend on you to be ready. And so do parents. We depend on you to be ready if you're a provider. Um, and as a parent, we try to help you be ready. 
Uh, how can we do this? Um, when, ch when children see adults reading food labels, they know that the adult is taking it seriously and can be trusted. So it's a, that's a powerful message. Um, an example of how this might sound is, uh, stop, let me look and see if this food would be good for your body. I always need to read the food label. Just by saying that, you're alerting them all that you're taking it seriously and this is what you need to do. So even though you've probably always been reading food labels, point it out. Relationship with peers. They're ready at these ages to, what matters, they're ready for social interaction. They're ready to learn how to get along with others. And as, as many of you know, if you work with little kids, it's a process and that's what they're working on. Um, why this matters in food allergies is because children with food allergies might not understand why they can't eat something their friend is eating. So they're starting to see now that other kids do things differently and they might not understand that. So how you can handle that is adults can model how children can get along and avoid feeling bad. Here's an example. If you notice them looking around, point it out and say, oh, do you see that they're eating something different? That food makes their body feel good, but it would make your body feel not so good or feel sick. That's just to extend what you can kind of see them uh, trying to starting to figure out. Ah, considering the perspective of others. This is a process. I call it the, why does he get everything special? That, that's a big leap to understand why they get everything special. So recognize that this emerges to understand the perspective of others comes closer to age five. So all these early years, they're not getting that. It's probably, you probably see that a lot in your day-to-day inter -day interactions. So why this matters for food allergies is that children without food allergies may not understand why their friend has a special snack or why someone bought something special for them. That really needs to be explained. So how? Adults need to recognize and acknowledge when children are observing others and model how to consider the perspective of others. So kind of meet them where they are and take it a step further. For example, you're right, they are getting something special. Acknowledge it, that's meeting where they are. And then take it a step further and explain that some people need special foods for their bodies to feel good. And then bring it back to something they share. But look, you can both have the, you're both having the, you have the same drink or you're at the same, you're in the same classroom or something, find something same. So it, this is part of them learning the, how to consider the perspective of others. Ah, negotiating and applying rules. Um, well, if you work with early childhood and if you're well-versed in it, um, you know that it's the all by self, think of a two-year-old, all by self, me, mine, me, all that. So they have to negotiate and apply a lot of rules. They seek independence, but they need us. They need vigilant supervision, observation. And when food allergies, how this impacts us, is that children can quickly put something in their mouth or they may wanna share a food as a sign of friendship. So how adults can handle this is they can safely store medication, medicine, near yet out of reach of children. And the consistent use of the message, stop, look, ask, go. And if you use that around the snack and mealtime, it will start to become part of the routine, similar to the cleanup song that you probably, many of you know. So an example of how this can work is, we worked together, you stopped, you looked, you asked if it was okay, and I read the food label, and I know that this food's okay. So yes, you can go and have this snack. Um, kind of bringing it back to that rules aren't bad, rules help keep us all safe. So do you remember this? We asked this at the front end of, of our presentation. And I'd like to revisit it because our words and our actions and our feelings can set a tone in our environments. So it's important to um, you know, keep that in mind. And all those words you entered, you do worry as a parent, you worry. It is scary, it can be, all these things are overwhelming, but we hold that as the adults. 
We worry and we manage. You worry and you manage. Um, it's about finding the balance. And maybe an example, all of us, even though I can't even see all of you, that all of us could relate to is uh, imagine you have a new, a toddler, you're out walking with a toddler and they run ahead of you on the sidewalk and they fall. And in that moment, you know, as the adult, they probably scrape their knee, maybe their elbow. They are probably bleeding. They might need a Band-Aid. They might not, um, they might have something else. You know, it's a big deal. But as you approach the child, if you do a big reaction, big panic reaction, you will get a bigger reaction from that child in that moment. On the other side of it, if you approach calmly, take deep breaths as you're approaching it, you get there and say, okay, get up, let's see, let's see. You're taking your deep breaths. Okay, you're, you're helping manage the moment and you're showing how staying calm and composed is helping, they might still cry, they might still be bleeding, they might still need Band-Aids, maybe many of them, maybe they even need stitches, but how that, ma that moment is managed will help calm the child. And um, I found it to be work for me very similarly when I've had to administer epinephrine. So what can we parents and providers both do is remember that you're a positive role model for all children. They can all benefit from stop, look, ask, and go. And learning those concepts is part of what they're learning at these ages anyway. So using age appropriate language and recognizing that they're not all verbal. So adding a hand signal to go with it, it really helps give the child control of, an, of this uncertain time for them too at mealtime or snack time. So age appropriate language and hand signals and then we know this about early childhood. They benefit from repetition and consistent, predictable, nurturing care. And that is something it's, you work on it every day. <laughs> um, so the message, stop, look, ask, and go. The more that you say that, the more they'll start to know that that's what they can do and it empowers them. Sorry, you're waiting for me, Sarah. <laughs> okay, so what are the next steps now? Um, we have the videos that we uh, showed you. It was the debut, so you all were the first to see those. Uh, these videos will be available to you, uh, both on the FAIR website and the CFAR website. I encourage you to share them widely. Uh, we will also try to distribute them to child care centers ourselves. Training. So CFAR, which is our Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research here in Chicago, has a partnership with FAIR. And our plans currently that are being discussed are to develop a professional development training course for early childhood professionals. Our goal is if they can be trained with these resources and others that we're developing, then they would be able to get a certificate saying they're trained. And uh, that might be nice for you as you're searching for a child care center and nice for them to have proper training and really understand how to care for children with food allergies. And inclusion. The videos are also available in Spanish, utilizing the closed caption option with the hope to reach more people who live and work with young children. So this was very important to us. We have and in Spanish, we don't have other languages yet, but as we see what the interest and demand is for the video, we are open to being able to provide this to everyone. And that's it. So uh, <laughs> we did leave a good 10 uh, or so minutes to uh, finally let you ask questions and uh, we'll try to answer them. Thank you all Wonderful. so much. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. And thank you, Sarah. Um, that was an awesome presentation, and I'm so excited about these resources and the videos. And before I jump into 
to some questions from the attendees. I just want to let you two know that a lot of comments were coming through the Q&A box that were saying how wonderful the videos are, asking when they could get them, and also really appreciating the song. So the song is just a nice added bonus. So a lot of people um, were excited about that. So thank you. And then just to all of our attendees, um, like Dr. Gupta said, we will be sending out links to these videos. So you will get um, a link uh, to the recording of this presentation as well as videos. So just kind of stay tuned to that. Um, hope to have that out to everybody next week. So, okay, with that said, um, I'd like to dive in and just ask a couple questions that came in. And first we'll start, um, we have an attendee, Mallory, and she was just asking kind of about overall like cleaning of surfaces. And, you know, she was saying how her and her spouse have recently discovered that, you know, using something like a baby wipe on a surface really isn't enough to clean up an allergen. And I know you mentioned earlier in the presentation as well, just about hand sanitizer and how that's not enough. So she just kind of wanted to ask a general question about cleaning, you know, especially of toys and surfaces, you know, for a play date. Or, or even in, you know, a daycare or preschool setting and, and, you know, children's behaviors to kind of touch everything and put their hands in their mouth. Um, is there any kind of specific advice you give around kind of cleaning of surfaces, you know, or, or what maybe they, a parent should bring with them to make sure the toys are clean? If you can just talk a little bit about that. I could say a couple things. Um, daycare providers and those on the call would know this, that, the, that there are protocols, like just being a licensed center, that they're wiping down things. So they have like the bleach water combination that they use. And at home, you can use the same depending on your surface and wipe things down, depending on the toy that's being shared. Um, that would be a thought I have. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question that came in from one of our attendees, which I think is great. And he was asking, can you suggest how to teach other kids who don't have food allergies? Um, and maybe they're using food allergies as a tool to bully other kids in the classroom. And unfortunately, this attendee has commented that it's happened to his child. But are there any tools or suggestions, you know, to educate um, kids who don't have food allergies around bullying and being respectful, you know, to their peers and their classmates. Yes, and thanks for asking this. I'll, I can start, Sarah, and can feel free to add in. Um, this has been brought up to us so many times, and it was very, very important to us. And what we, what we understand is that, you know, kids don't understand food allergies. And uh, for a young child to think that a food could really hurt someone, is kind of a foreign concept. Um, so it is so important to make them aware and educated. And what we've seen is if we do educate them, they tend to become much more supportive of that friend. So I'm so glad you asked that because that is exactly what we need to do is actually really teach kids without food allergies, classmates, peers about food allergies and specifically how they can help and support their friends with food allergy. Um, you know, for this, we created the song and the videos for young children. But if you have a child that's a little bit older, we have an elementary school video that we did create just for this purpose. We created an elementary peer-to-peer, -peer, a middle school peer-to-peer, -peer, and a high school peer-to-peer. -peer. And all of those can be found on our website. They're free. Um, we even have a, a thumb drive we can send out to you that you can just give to your um, school or have for yourself that has all the videos on it. But the peer-to-peer -peer videos are, are kids talking to kids. So it's a classroom setup, and these kids are, are talking about their food allergies and what they do, and then they're going into how do you support your friends. So again, I am happy to share all of them. They come with a teacher's guide, um, and you can and we, we shared them with FAIR, and hopefully they'll have those resources on their website too. But on our website, they're currently up, and that's uh, – what is our CFAR, C F A A R dot Northwestern dot edu. And if you just go to videos, educational videos, you can um, you can see it right there. But thanks for bringing that up. I would I would add too that that's why we say reassure all children, educate all children. I think that um, it's really important, and I think 
if we, I'm excited about early childhood, it's the foundation year. So if you can teach kids from the start that this is just how their body is, and we we stop, we all stop. They all could benefit from stopping before they eat something and looking before they eat something and asking if it's okay to eat something. Uh, think of it as a pause before you eat. Um, so I think that if that gets, if early childhood could do this well, I think bullying would come down. I, that's my, my view of it because I think that it's all about not understanding what's happening. And I want to add, because I was trying to read through some of the comments, and I so appreciate what everybody is saying on this, um, on this Q&A feed, but somebody did mention that, uh, that they did do an educational session at their child care center, and it was very much appreciated. I don't know if it was for the whole class, but when we uh, piloted these videos and we took them to schools, I tell you, kids were very curious. They asked so many questions and really wanted to learn. And it actually opened up the child with food allergies because they were answering the questions and they felt very empowered uh, at that moment. And really, uh, I think if, if you have time or if you just want to use the videos, um, really talking to kids about food allergies. There's also some great books around it um, that explain food allergies very clearly and uh, happy to share some of those suggestions with you. But there are many ways to educate kids. And, Kids are naturally curious, they want to learn, and um, they will ask those questions and have a better understanding to support their friends. Sorry. Wonderful. Thank you. And again, we at Bear will we'll make sure, we'll work with um, Dr. Gupta and Sarah and make sure that we send out links to all of these great resources. So no worries about writing anything down. We'll make sure you, you get this so that you can, you can share with your centers. Um, okay, next question we got. And I thought this was interesting because, Sarah, you were talking a little bit in the presentation just, you know, about use, the importance of using age-appropriate language. So we have a question from Tiffany, and she was asking if you have any suggested language to share with caretakers when telling a child that they cannot have a certain food. Is there any way to do that in a more positive way? She's noticed, um, you know, caretakers tend to say just, no, you can't have that, or no, you're not allowed. You know, and it, it kind of comes off as really negative. And she says it, it even makes her two-year-old want it more. So is there mm -hmm. um, any suggested language, you know, a more softer, positive yeah, way? For sure. I have, I have about 14 years of navigating that one. Um, and I, I, go with, I go with, look at that food. Like, even though there's some fancy cupcake or something like, oh, I know that looks good, but it would make your body feel so sick. And we don't want your body to feel sick. And just to be honest with it, just to, um, that food will make your body feel very sick. If they've had a recent reaction, the good, if there's a good thing to a reaction, is they know what sick feels like, and then they don't want to feel sick. If they don't know what, the re what sick feels like, um, it's just that, you know, you don't want your body to itch, to, uh, to uh, you know, just get sick like that. That's, some, that's a way that I have found really works. And then to kind of channel it, kind of get out of that, um, move, meet them where they are and take it to the next step. But let's find all the things you can have. Get it right to, back to can. And I think that helps. Love that, thank you. Um, we had a couple questions coming in, actually one before the, the presentation today came in, um, just kind of about, you know, what you look for when you are maybe touring daycares or preschools or thinking about sending your young child to one. I mean, as you both mentioned several times, it can be daunting and stressful and overwhelming. Um, we have Sarah joining us today. and. And she just mentioned that she has two kids with food allergies and they've had to actually switch daycares a couple of times um, for mistakes that were made. And just wondering if, if either of you had any advice on what to look for and maybe questions to ask in order to vet possible daycares or preschools and schools. You want me to go? Oh, Sarah, I can, I'll say just one quick thing. You know, we did another study um, looking at economic costs for food allergy a couple of years ago, and we're getting ready to redo it now. But I'll tell you, one of the biggest costs parents face out of pocket 
was changes in, in schools and changes in, in caretakers because um, because it is very challenging to find the right one. Um, child care centers are usually very busy and very overwhelmed, and uh, it can be it can be um, difficult. I think if you set up a meeting and really you you'll get a feel for how much uh, they have training, you know how aware they are, and if you go through kind of all the questions that we outlined. Uh, a little bit earlier um, with them, and if they take the time to do that with you, I think that's a very positive sign. I feel like you can you can read um, their interest or their participation um, pretty pretty easily. But I'll let Sarah answer because this is her area of expertise for sure. Yeah, um, you know, uh, depending on what state you're in, there are you know there are accreditations that they have. Find out like because the with um, you know, in Illinois, we have Accelerate Illinois. The higher up you go, the more training your staff has. Um, so that's some, one place to start in asking questions. But also a good feeler would be like, hey, I've heard about these videos or there, if, fair, if um, we pull this off and get this training up and running, is your center amenable to doing the training or ha has your staff been trained? How do you educate all parents? Would you be willing to share a parent to parent video or something like that? Just like Dr. Gupta said, see how uh, amenable they are to this, um, you know, little element of diversity that's entered their mix because it does require them to adapt, modify, and I'm guessing that's the kind of place that you would want your child to be at. Wonderful, thank you. And I wish we could stay all day, but if I can keep you both for just one more question. Um, and yeah. thank you to our attendees for being so engaged. I love it. Um, just a quick question, you know, about general advice. And we had a few people ask this, like, about how would you, how do you recommend explaining food allergies to a young child, to a toddler, you know, that isn't terrifying? And as a follow-up to that, you know, what's the best way to kind of talk to them about you know an epinephrine auto injector, you know, so that they aren't scared or they aren't terrified, um, you know, of of food allergies or possibly having to use that medication. Right, and you know, I'm reading through these, and I so badly want to answer them all, and I I can't tell you how what great questions these are. Um, so I'll tell you just something about epinephrine that we do at some of our our conferences we hold that really empower kids and. Usually, as they get older, but even young um, young kids, because it is very scary. And I, I can tell you, my daughter too has been so scared of the idea of epinephrine. But then, typically, you know, usually what we see is when you do use it. Um, and now that the epinephrine uh, auto injectors are, are, you know, you have to hold them for less time, two seconds for the ABQ, three seconds uh, for the EpiPen. Um, I think it makes it a little bit easier because it's just really quick. Before it was 10 seconds and that seemed like eternity. Um, but one thing that I think uh, is, is fun for kids and kind of takes a little bit of the scare away um, is, is practicing. So if you have any expired ones, um, get a grapefruit and, and just use it on the grapefruit. And you see that when you pull it out, there's no needle, right? So a couple of them, um, most auto injectors, there's no needle. You can't see it because a lot of kids are, are scared and parents of, um, of that needle and how big it is. And, and you will see the fact that one, it's really tiny and two, you'll never see it. And so I think practicing and even letting the kids practice, just holding their hand and holding it and, and seeing how taking that kind of scary feeling away to some extent. And this obviously um, needs to be age appropriate, but that's, that's one piece of advice um, that I did want to share because I know we've been doing that at our meetings and kids get really empowered and tell us that they're not scared anymore. Um, so that was, that was one piece I wanted to share. And I also wanted to share, you know, somebody said something about could food allergies be on the rise because we're not feeding it early. And I, I do want to make sure you all know that the new guidelines say that uh, we should be introducing peanut products earlier, around six months, not the first food, but soon after. So again, uh, FAIR, we're working with FAIR to really get prevention information out there. And I did, I saw that come up, so I wanted to let you know about that. Um, there's so many other ones here I want to just mention, but I'll see if Sarah has additional things she wants to add. Yeah, I would, I would add that just 
uh, you do want to reduce fear in young children. And they don't, under, I'm talking about children under six, they don't need to know everything. And even my example I gave of my son saying, why does everyone feel sorry for him? You even have to watch your conversations that you're having with friends, family, providers. Be mindful that this is, it's, it is scary. So we want to protect them from that. And that's why what they can do, you can empower them because if they stop, that's something they can do. Stop when you see food. And that, that's great. That's a way to, so that you don't have this reaction. But also when you're talking about the medicine, I always keep it at medicine. Like if you need your medicine, um, I'll give it to you when you need it. They don't have to be worrying about epinephrine. You won't even know if they'll need it. You, you don't even know until that moment to make the decision. So I think that that would be something I would, I would share with you that adults get one message, children get another. And you have to respect the young child in that way. And I love the comments coming in because this is really what we see in our research too. Once, once you use it, you become more confident using it. When you see your child recover and feel so much better, then they feel so much better um, using it again. So if that helps at all, all these comments that are coming in about it, um, that is another positive way. You know, talk to others who have used it. You know, there's a couple young students who have used it so many times and they've created videos showing themselves using it and showing themselves feel better and showing how it doesn't hurt. And if, if watching a video like that would help your child, like, oh, look at this other kid and they used it and they feel better. Mm -hmm. um, those are other, other good resources that we'll share. Wonderful. So I am back to just say a huge thank you to both of you and a big thank you to our attendees. And I want to say, uh, Dr. Gupta, you mentioned early introduction and FAIR has a website, babiesfirst.org, that will kind of tell you all things about um, starting introducing solids to your baby and early introduction of allergens. So feel free to check that out. Um, and then back to the topic at hand, just thank you so much for giving us your time today. And we will be sure to share all these resources with everyone joining us and really encourage you to share them with your daycare centers and early childhood centers and um, providers, because um, they're so beneficial. It's a perfect training. So thank you both and thanks everyone. We'll see you soon.